I mean, definitely. I mean, if you look at the feminist movement, the Me Too movement, what have they focused on? They focused on usually middle class, highly educated people in business or in, you know, industries who have had someone touch their knee inappropriately. Yeah. Or even worse, you know, sexual abuse, proper sexual abuse. And meanwhile, there's an absolute silence from the left on the grooming gangs that are still ongoing throughout the country. Yeah. And that sort of thing, it's just, it just really, really, um, it, it's so frustrating. I'm here with Emily Carver, who's the IEA's media manager or Institute Hello. of Economic Affairs. <laughs> so what, what is the Institute of Economic Affairs? What's the, what does a media manager do? Just give me a kind of a background of your role and so on. Okay, so I joined the uh, Institute of Economic Affairs in November. Previously, I'd been working for a Conservative MP, James Heapy, in his Westminster office. Yeah. And then I decided, I'd sort of been looking around at the think tanks for a while, yeah. seeing, seeing what they were like. You know, there's lots to choose from. Adam Smith Institute, Policy Exchange. Yeah. Probably some of your viewers will have, will have heard of those. Yeah, we just um, did up with Adam Smith Institute. You know, yeah, Matt I Lech, saw Matt that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was it? That was good, actually. Yeah? Yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Yeah, he's fantastic. He's really, really good. Yeah. He has a lot to say. Um, gives that sort of Aussie yeah <laughs> Aussie angle um yeah so um I decided that the IEA was a good fit yeah applied for this role I think it was really sort of coming up to the election I was worried at the time that young people and also the rest of rest of the public were sort of starting to sort of um believe what Corbyn was saying yeah and that there was a sort of there was an anger in politics and I really wanted to make a difference and come to work for the IEA, which supports free markets and yeah. free people, um, I thought that that would be the right thing for me to do, where I can really make my own voice heard yeah. and also the voices of all the, all the great academics and researchers here that yeah. are doing so much for the cause. So, so yeah, as a media manager, what do I do? Obviously, there's a lot of traditional media, so we press release our publications, we comment on what's going on. Um, in the news, we yeah. don't have a corporate view. We're yeah. overall, overall, we take a sort of classical liberal perspective. There are people who um, come from a more liberal democrat kind of background, and then there are more free market conservative types, which is where I sort of come in. Um, but yeah, we all agree in free markets and um, uh, free people. Okay, so what is it about? So we should definitely come back to that Corbyn point in a bit. Mm. But so just in terms of the free market stuff, what is it about the free market which you think is so important? Like, why is it you're committed to that as a way of governing things and running the economy and so on? So I think for me, it's the idea of um, free markets not only allow people to live their lives freely, but they allow creation of wealth. Yeah. It's through um, private enterprise, not through the state, that people are allowed to express themselves, that people are able to get rich and do well for their families and do better. And it's how we fund the public services that we've grown accustomed to. Yeah. Um, it's how people um, are able to express their creativity. I mean, our generation are one of the most entrepreneurial, yet they're, yet the majority voted Labour in the, in the last election. And there's, there's sort of that um, that conflict there that's something that I really want to um, well sort of campaign or just give my voice to because yeah. I feel that our generation millennials and the younger generation are naturally um, free market minded yeah. you know they enjoy all the things that capitalism has brought us be it you know Uber or um, Deliveroo um, and just the the quality of life that we all enjoy. Yeah. It's from enterprise, hard work, aspiration. And on the other hand, what's the what's the alternative? Yeah. Most of the time people say um it's socialism or some form of socialism. Um but if we look at socialist um governments or um throughout history, um they've often been the most closed the most um, lacking of freedoms, human rights, yeah. um, compared to capitalist free markets. So while there are, of course, a lot of young people that are concerned with things like inequality, there's a lack of, um, there's a lot of young people who don't believe that they'll ever have a, own a house. Yeah. 
And these are all issues that we at the IEA think can be bettered by free markets. Okay. We look to free markets as the way to bring people out of poverty. It's yeah. been proven. I'm sure Matt said, you know, millions, billions of people are brought out of poverty every year. Yeah. Through trade. Yeah. Um, through global cooperation and through running businesses. Yeah, that's something I want to talk to you about. So what you come up... Because I actually am not exactly sure where I stand on the free market. Because aren't think. you coming from the left? I'm, well, I can't... I You're on a journey. Yeah, I'm on a journey. <laughs> well, I was initially like super left wing. Mm. And then I was You like, did a video. Yeah. What was it? Um, so, why I left the left. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's actually kind of provocatively titled. I like that. Like, that was just yeah. like clickbait title. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure if I've left the left. It's good to have... Okay, you're still sort of... I'm still like on... I'm not yeah. really... I just don't really have an ideological position. I think there are certain like foundations yeah. of my thought, mm-hmm. which I kind of have generally always held even when I was left wing. But they're still open. I, I don't think it makes any sense to just have a completely set view on anything and then never change it. So, no, I agree. I'm not ideological per se. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of, I guess... A free market Tory, yeah, um, quite socially conservative, but yeah. um, but also freedom minded. It's it's. I'm not really an ideologue. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's the best way of looking at things. You've yeah. got to make pragmatic decisions, and I think those generally lie on my side of the argument. Yeah, but that's that's kind I of what I think. Yeah. As in, it just seems to be. So I was so so left wing, and also a part and parcel of that worldview. In a lot of cases, especially now, is just to see the people who disagree with you as basically they're being kind of evil mm-hmm. or really stupid. Yeah. Or greedy or having some form of moral flaw rather mm-hmm. than just thinking something different. Mm-hmm. And I think once you start seeing that there are arguments which you can easily win from the other perspective or which are very valid from the other perspective. Yeah. In that kind of dogmatic left. Yeah. I think there's way. definitely yeah. a sort of, I mean, I find it definitely in the left, um, not just from friends, but also, you know, in the media, from commentators, the sort of sense of moral superiority that a lot of people yeah. on the left have. And it's... It's very hard to debate and it's very hard to have, you know, proper conversations about issues when people will assert something to be true. Yeah. So let's say it's poverty is getting worse. Yeah. Okay. I can say, um, well, actually, if you look at these different indicators, if you look at material deprivation, for example, it's actually gone down a lot since 2010. I think it's by a third. But then even before you've got to that point... Yeah. It's almost as if how dare you even exactly how dare you even argue or pretend that poverty isn't absolutely the yeah. most horrific since Dickensian times or whatever. But that's that's like that was actually one of the number one reasons why I stopped being completely committed to the left. But like I said, I don't know if I'm left or right. I don't really strongly subscribe to one view. Sure. But a lot. That's of a nice place to be. I mean, what are you in your twenties? Yeah, late. Late, late 20s. twenties. Yeah, like, still a few days left. You don't need to have. Well, I don't think people should have. A set position. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, you can say... So one of the main reasons I was there doing initially was I was really committed to getting rid of poverty to the great, mm-hmm. like to the greatest extent possible, which yeah. I set out. <clears throat> um, but then I realised that it wasn't necessarily completely clear cut that having a global socialist economy or mm-hmm. having a socialist economy in one nation or whatever was actually the best way of getting rid of poverty. And kind of, I realised at that point that my commitment to try and lift humans out of poverty overrode my commitment to redistributing wealth because mm-hmm. what I value more out of the two is trying to improve the average human's quality of life and when I would mention that point to other left-wing people mm-hmm. and the, it was kind of just like this reset button just got set which is like you get to the end of the discussion you're like well I think it might be the case that capitalism is actually lifting people out of poverty at an incredibly quick pace yeah. basically unprecedented in history yeah. and at that exact point in time you're saying we need to overthrow it all like how do you respond to that because I have qualms and their response would just be like just like go dead does not compute. Yeah, and it's does like not reset, compute. But I mean, it. if you look at Corbyn's campaign, I mean, the amount of times he mentioned billionaires. Yeah. And there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that if you were to tax billionaires slightly more, that would lift people out of poverty. It just wouldn't. Yeah. And you can argue about what tax rate is the best to have. Or you can argue about, you know, how much redistribution you should have in an economy. Yeah. But the sort of idea that demonising billionaires, overthrowing capitalism is the way to lift people out of poverty. Yeah. It just is not factually correct. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's not, not helpful. Yeah. It just comes across as, um, you know, the politics of envy. Although, one point I do about that billionaire point. So, so I think on all these issues, I think it's the free market point that I'm the mm. least sure how far I've swung to the right on. I can definitely see a case mm. for saying that without getting rid of capitalism, <clears> it still might be possible to redistribute some wealth. I just don't think it's possible to be certain about 
either outcome because I, I can't think I don't think there's any evidence which conclusively proves that one system of capitalism for example slightly redistributive or completely free market works better than the other but I could be wrong um, but when it comes to the billionaire point I was a bit confused because I actually had some sympathy with that Corbynite view of saying well we could still have I'm not sure that a lot of Corbynistas are saying this, but kind of I can see how you could make the argument for capitalism, but say there might be something wrong with the system if it's allowing certain people to amass such a disproportionate amount of the wealth. So I, I can see why someone who is kind of from a populist left wing mm -hmm. standpoint, you might have a lot of the same concerns that people on the populist right do. Yeah. Might look at people saying that criticizing billionaires is mean to billionaires and think, well, actually, I think it's possible to have all the other concerns I have as a populist, but still think there may be slightly more taxation. But it's sort like of that. a, I mean, definitely I believe that billionaires should pay their taxes. Yeah. Um, like, without a doubt, obviously. But I think it's difficult to, I think if you, oh God, I just, just lost my phone short. Can you oh, cut yeah. me off then? Yeah. A really good point. What yeah. was it? Um, uh, what were we talking about? Billionaires. Basically just, I just reckon the thing which constantly annoys me the most of everything in public discourse at the moment, well, one of the things which annoys me the most is the kind of irrational side of left-wing mm -hmm. dogmatic thinking. Yeah. And I, in those respects, side, in those debates, I tend to instinctively side a lot with the people who are coming from your kind of yeah. more right conservative perspective. Yeah. One area where I have a kind of latent degree, of quite a lot of sympathy still with a vague left-wing position, I think, is the point that we could possibly reorganise some aspects of capitalism to mean that there wasn't such a rapid, like, such a vast inequality between the richest and the poorest. Because I think you could still have things like the profit motive if you could only own a billion pounds as opposed to 120 billion pounds. We can tax and redistribute um, in terms of health service, um, schooling, education, um, but taxing to such a degree where it sort of prevents um, prevents economic um, activity yeah. and stops people from sort of growing their businesses, um, taking on more people, that actually ends up with more less money in the treasury to spend on other things. Yeah. Um, so it's a sort of a balancing act, isn't it? I think it's very easy to sort of look at people who have amassed a fortune and think, well, there's something, you know, not quite right about that. Yeah. But I think, you know, we need to grow the pie and yeah. that allows more and more people to come out of out of poverty. But I think in terms of the sort of inequality, I think that we do have a massive problem when it comes to housing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I can't remember the statistics, but I think it's way over half of people our age who think that they'll never own a, their own property. Yeah. Um, and this is just a lack of supply. So something else I wanted to ask you about is, something which I, noticed a lot is that there's this constant tendency no matter what the kind of material realities of the situation are in the world there's this tendency on the left to constantly talk about things as if they're very very bad and I think that, yeah. that obviously there are really really bad things going on in the world so if anyone said that there wasn't poverty for example in Africa you yeah like, that'd be kind of crazy yeah. but it's the way it's presented because while there is poverty it's gone down at a more rapid rate in the last 40 years than it's ever gone down at any other. Yeah, I'm sure Matt has all the figures for those. Yeah, yeah, Matt. We have um, one of our policy advisors to Mark Littlewood, who's the director general. He's, yeah. um, do you know him? He's yeah, a yeah. Yeah, big name. Um, he focuses completely on Africa. Yeah. And he writes a lot of articles. I don't know if people are interested, but just about how Africa, you know, people used to say, is there any hope for this continent? And yeah. of course, there's huge corruption issues. Of course, there's huge, like, um, you know, um, uh, religious conflicts going on in Africa. Yeah. But if you look at the economic stats, it's quite remarkable how much um, enterprise and um, trade ha are, is bringing people out of poverty. Yeah. Um, and it's through that. I mean, you can give people aid, but that only lasts so long. It's really about um, fostering free enterprise. Yeah, I mean, that's actually... Yeah, as I said, I think that's probably the one of the main real real like that's one of the main strong issues i've got with the left mm. also, i just think like it's so crazy that you can so i would look no matter what my point of view whether i was left or right i would look at the world and think the main thing i basically want to do is make everyone have a better life that's how any rational person i think would look at politics mm -hmm. and i looked at the world and thought okay initially i was taught all the same stuff that everyone else was taught which is things are unbelievably terrible <clears> the system <throat> is awful 
you're taught to look at the worst things there are and then yeah. think that that is how you judge the system. Yeah. And then as time went on, I thought, actually, what I can see is that there's indisputable evidence that in the last 40 years, things have become basically immeasurably better at a more rapid rate than they have ever had them before. And over the last 200 years, things have as well. And the tendency, despite that, is to try and change the system away from what it is currently to something else yeah. without any evidence that the other system would continue that trend towards things getting better. And I think it's that disconnect which really, I find, if not immoral, at least really, really irrational. And the willingness to kind of sacrifice potentially the gains which have to be made under the existing system just at the altar of pursuing a particular ideological worldview as a way of governing things seems really almost religious to me. Oh so, yeah. They're so committed to continuing this idea of socialism, even though it's failed time and time again. And my colleague Christian Niemitz, um, he's written so much about the ph phenomenon of socialism, millennial socialism, um, and he wrote a book called um, uh, Socialism, the Failed, Ide Failed Idea That Never Dies. Yeah. And it essentially looks through all the different sort of socialist um, governments that have been. So it looks at Venezuela, it looks at the Soviet Union, it looks at China under Mao, Cambodia. All these um, socialist countries or governments where people, Western intellectuals, looked at them and thought, you know, this is going to be the next big thing. Yeah. This is our, you know, the it's ideal. Okay. It's going to be fantastic. People are going to be, f you know, free. It's going to be this communis communist... Um, socialist dream and then slowly things start going badly yeah and then it takes and then you know they start saying oh well that wasn't real socialism yeah and then they move on to the next dream um i mean at the debate we were going to talk about this but at the debate i was at with grace blakely yeah um there was another chap there who was a an intellectual from cambridge yeah um and he sort of thought you know communal living is the way forward yeah. And he cited how in northern Syria that people are living in this sort of democratic, socialist, sort of sharing, caring um, uh, community, society, and where there's no sort of sexual discrimination, everyone's equal. Yeah. And I'm just thinking that's sort of like how people saw Venezuela. Yeah. They thought it was the next big thing. Mm. And as we've seen through history every socialist society has followed the same yeah, trajectory. Yeah. That's, yeah, I think so. Because like, you can't organise a society in the way you want. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, uh, so I guess the only area where we slightly differ is I'm not completely committed to capitalism as an end in itself. I think there might be a better system. I genuinely don't know what it might be. But it's but the where I would agree with you is I find it really disconcerting when if the strong weight of evidence is one system seems to work better than the other and that the system we're under at the moment, despite having real problems, is also making amazing progress. Yeah. The fact that you can present those kind of almost <clears throat> indisputable facts to someone and then that they come out with that every single time, concluding that the system which seems to repeatedly not work as well as R1 is the one which we should aim towards mm -hmm. and that defending R1 can only possibly be a product of greed, mm -hmm. being evil or being stupid. That seems like yeah. basically a religious impulse because I'm not religious at all. Oh, definitely. And it feels yeah. like a religion. So there are problems with capitalism. Free marketeers see those problems. Yeah. Um, but they don't, obviously, but they see that this is the best system that we can live under. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be improved. Yeah, yeah, that seems to make sense. Um, fine, so why don't we talk about that event you were at? <laughs> what was it? What's the title? It was, like, it was. I've got it written down here somewhere. What was the... There were lots of different questions, but I think they... Oh, yes. Yeah. Is capitalism being... Is is capitalism bringing us to the edge of extinction? Yes. So yeah. do we need to overthrow capitalism to save the planet? Yeah. It was an interesting debate. I think they were very glad to have... This was at Essex University, which is quite interesting because apparently it has more of a, more of a naturally conservative um, student body. Yeah. But the professors are very far left. Oh, that, so it's quite interesting. Quite left everywhere, though. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, that's the difference because I think in the past you had student bodies were generally more left than the rest of the public. Yeah. But I think now the professors. The professors are, so are the ones that, egging it on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So basically, my view with this environmental stuff is, and this is one of many issues that I find myself in between the kind of yeah. left and the right is I share the concern about the environment. And I do actually think we should. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not an expert on the science. I'm not really sure that anyone 
whoever talks about this stuff publicly really is, but my instinct is that if loads of scientists are saying something, it, it could all, it might all be a massive scam, but it seems probable that it's something we should take really seriously and we should try and mitigate the effects of climate sure. change as much as we possibly can. Um, and I think that we should take some form of probably governmental action and also we should definitely try and create technologies to overcome what's yeah. happening. But I also think, that, so I, I kind of don't really share that right-wing position of just, oh, the whole thing's rubbish and everyone who's talking about it is just a massive socialist. Yeah. Or, ma or it's just a means of criticism. Yeah, but I think on that point, I think what's missing from the debate is there's these sort of government plans, yeah. so net zero by 2050, yeah. um, banning petrol and diesel cars, um, and so on. And there isn't really an honest discussion with the public about what the trade-offs are going to be. Yeah. Because to get to net zero, you'd have to massively cut down on aviation as it stands. Um, massively cut down on car use. Um, you'd have um, uh, most of our um, homes are fueled by gas. Yeah. So we'd have to retrofit everyone's boilers millions of millions of people's boilers so these yeah. are huge things mm. um and whilst we are doing i think a lot of people on the left forget how well we are doing as well yeah so if you look at um you know we've cut our emissions by nearly half in the power sector yeah so that's electricity um yes we still need gas to heat our homes yeah um but we are making big progress and also i do worry that we're sort of talking about, you know, the UK cutting its emissions. But at the end of the day, we only account for 1% of the world's emissions. Yeah. I think it's important that we use our voice around the world. Yeah. Use our soft power um, to encourage the big carbon emitters like China. Yeah. If China halved its coal use, that would be the equivalent of um, the whole of the EU plus the UK going carbon neutral. Yeah. So that's... I mean, that just kind of puts it in, into perspective. And I also think it's very easy for, you know, sort of privileged people in the West to sort of talk about, you know, we need to move away from capitalism and growth. We don't need perpetual growth, like George Monbiot said. Yeah. And those in Navarra media say. But, you know, it tries telling that to people in developing countries. Yeah. Yeah, that's Where what, growth that's is their means for a job. Yeah. Um, they're not going to suddenly give up their car. Because you think that we should all they be living in a They probably didn't have a car. Yeah, they probably <laughs> yeah, like, they don't you know, have, like, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. That's yeah. Like, so that's what I was going to get onto. Is yeah. that I, so I, I kind of share the concern. I do actually think it should be taken really seriously. And I'm not yeah. sure I mind if you accept, which I'm not obviously can't be sure about, that there is a really serious threat. Then I think maybe taking some hit in developed Western nations in terms of the standard of living, especially among the kind of richer sections of society, is not ideal. But... I can see if it's a toss up between that or really bad consequences of the environment, it might be worth taking some hit. Like I wouldn't mind maybe driving a bit less if it meant that it might be better for the environment, let's say. But then when those it comes are individual to like, choices, right? But when it comes to and they like, shouldn't be for the government to mandate top down. Mm, well, but then I mean, if you think like because that's people's livelihoods. Yeah, but if you genuinely think that, so this is kind of the first tranche of my point. But let's say you genuinely think that there is a threat to the planet's well-being, mm -hmm. whatever that means. It's kind of yeah. like, it sounds a bit like fluffy, but we'll put it as in like, there is some form of really serious yeah. threat. Then I guess, personally, I wouldn't be that opposed to some form of legislation or regulation which tries to maybe limit your freedom as an individual to do exactly what you want if it also enables us to take more effective action to protect the planet. But I guess, would you think that like the freedom argument is more important? Well, I think, I mean, for me, environmentalism and my conservatism go hand in hand yeah um like conservatives do care about the environment yeah um it's about conserving what's you know what's ours for future generations yeah um and that's something very important you know it's margaret thatcher who was the first to talk about climate change on the global stage and roger scruton who who passed away he was very passionate about the environment yeah um so i think that it is important that we look after our surroundings. And my concern is that the government are honest with the public yeah. about these trade-offs. And I think that it's very easy for people living in London who don't use cars because they use the tube network. Yeah. And they can afford to sort of, you know, set off their carbon emissions, offset their carbon emissions, yeah. or buy vegan or yeah. whatever, to sort of virtue signal about the environment yeah. when 
you know, there's people who are electricians or um, um, whatever other industry, yeah. hairdresser or whatever, who need to be mobile and need yeah. to use their cars to, yeah, just yeah. to get around. Yeah, no, I definitely, and especially, um, so I definitely think when it comes to on a global level as well, it's way more complicated mm-hmm. than it's made out, as in it's just like a matter of if you don't think we should basically be very, very fearful about any further development, you don't care about the world. But actually, that is another example of the point I was talking about with the development thing, which is it's possible to be really concerned about the environment, which I am, but one of the main reasons I'd be concerned, not the only, but one of the main reasons I'd be concerned is the impact it's going to have on humanity. Mm-hmm. But you can show that the development which is happening, which in, in some part is contributing mm-hmm. annoyingly to climate change, is also bringing literally billions of people out of basically abject poverty yeah. and into a position where they might be able to feed their family much more easily and spend less than 16 hours a day working every single day in mm-hmm. complete poverty conditions and then dying really young. And so I think it's not as clear cut that wanting to see development in those regions is just selfish, crazy yeah. capitalism as yeah. it's often made up. So that's kind of more when And also concerned. as we advance and create growth and get richer, we use less to create things. Yeah. So, you know, like... Um, uh, you, you, well, you, we because of economies of scale and things, we end up using less carbon. Yet less, um, uh, we have less waste because we can do things efficiently. Yeah. So as people get richer, they can do more with less. Yeah. And we're wasting, wasting, um, wasting less. And it's um. It's like there was that scheme which they, with like loads of celebrities of Prince Charles and stuff were involved in, where they were paying Indian peasant farmers to continue farming like an Indian peasant, so they're basically subsidising them to continue using their traditional techniques rather than getting a tractor or something. Which, it's not even clear cut at all that that is better for the environment, it might be worse, but it definitely means that those people end up having to keep mm. farming in a way which means that they have like back-breaking manual labour to do every day rather than reaping the benefits of development. So I think it's yeah. like there's also that anti... I think basically my position would probably be a techno... without wanting to use like the wankiest word ever, <laughs> it would be like a techno-optimist way of approaching it, which is, I think it's a problem, but I think technological development, whilst it's also partly caused the problem, it's also the most likely way we've got of solving it. Like, if Tesla's become really popular, it'll be much more effective than just everyone stopping driving forever. Yeah, and I I mean, working for James Heapy in Parliament, um, his main concern, policy concern, was climate change, and we spent so much time talking to different businesses, talking to the aviation sector, talking to... um, small companies that were um, building these energy efficiency pro- uh, products yeah. um, that will help people use less energy, um, create less waste, and really help us to decarbonise. And that's where the solutions were coming from. They weren't coming from government. Government can legislate and regulate, yeah. but the ideas come from the private sector. Yeah. And so that's why the government needs to work with the market rather than against it. Because so, at the end of the day, it's from technology, as you said, yeah. that will create these massive advancements. Saying, no, slow down a bit that's a false economy yeah so i think that yeah the progress is with the, the, that's, technology yeah exactly that's the key thing is that's what's so weird human about... ingenuity yeah <laughs> exactly but that's what's so weird is how much of the discussion about it is basically it's not just a purely scientific discussion of there's some you know, climate change we need to address it yeah we need to mitigate the harm which i'm completely in favor of yeah. it's also this ideological thing which in not all of it but a lot of the green movement i think is underpinned by this kind of anti-humanist really oh, yeah. anti-developmental outlook, which is what I want to know, because I don't want to just completely dismiss the whole thing. I quite want to get on board. It would be quite fun just to be able to go on a march saying, please, can we try and do something about climate change yeah. without... But I couldn't do that because I know that the person next to me would probably be saying things like, there are too many humans and we need to get... Oh, yeah. I mean, just like... I mean, if you look back to the Extinction Rebellion protests in Parliament Square, I mean, Jesus, there were hordes of teenagers, all with the socialist workers' placards. Yeah. Um, system change, not climate change. <clears throat> and then there were people with, you know, the red flag with hammer and sickle, you know. Yeah. And it was sort of this this equivalence between socialism and looking after the environment that I just thought was really dangerous because I thought these young people are sort of being brainwashed yeah. by this ideology. But I think there needs to be a balanced discussion of course, there are people who are sceptical of, 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 of climate science, of course. Um, but we have that target in place now. We have net zero. So even if you are sceptical, 
it's in place. Yeah. We need to come up with solutions. Yeah. And the IEA are going to be looking at a lot of free market solutions to environmental problems. Okay. Sort of add to the debate in that way. Okay. But yeah. Fine. So why don't we move on to yeah. something else you talked about a lot, which is the gender pay gap. Yeah. So this is uh, this is something else which uh, I said when I was like I was obviously wouldn't I don't want to see any sexism in society and I would like there to be equality between men and women. Yeah. And I would start studying these things at university. Let's say from the basic assumption which everyone else shared more or less that oh obviously there is this massive massive gap between men and women and there's these really serious systems in place which stop women being able to compete with men or which stop different people being able to compete with the same job in the same way and I wrote all my essays like that but then the more and more I got down into the kind of specifics of the data I realized that it was actually much more complicated than that and the picture being painted didn't marry up to the present day kind of statistics it more or less is a discussion which came out of the situation maybe 30, 40 years yeah. ago and has been continued today. Yeah, there's and this narrative that's been perpetuated by feminist groups um, that women are hard done by, that women can't succeed in a male-dominated world, that they're going to be paid less, that they're less likely to do well, You know, they're likely to suffer sexual discrimination, and the data doesn't back that up. Yeah. Um, it may have done in years gone by, but now, if you're a woman and under 40, there is no gender pay gap between men and women. Yeah. I am likely to get paid the same, if not more, as you. Yeah. It's completely you're disappeared. Paid more than me now. Where, the gap, where the gap comes in, and yeah. for part time work, women are actually paid more than yeah. their male counterparts under the age of 40. Where the gap starts to kick in is at the age 40. Yeah. And what's happened between that time? A lot of women, which feminists don't seem to understand, make a decision to maybe um, forego a promotion so that they can sort of spend more time with their family. They decide to be a mother and that requires them to take a year or so out at the very least. Yeah. Um, and they make different decisions. And all those things don't add up to mean discrimination. Yeah. And we can argue about whether men should take more of the burden of childcare or whether childcare should be more freely available for people. But that's not the same as saying, you know, putting it on the employer, saying yeah. you're sexist, you're not paying this person enough. So it's a, it does a disservice to women because women are doing so well. In fact, women now are more likely to go to university yeah. than men. And I think this emphasis on women being victims sort of forgets all the fantastic stuff that women are doing. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I think it's easier for women to get ahead now in terms of when they start out in a workplace. There are so many initiatives for women, whether it's, you know, women in work. I'm sure you saw this in law, like um, there's always women in the workplace things or how to get to the top as a woman. And it's sort of like, I don't want to forget about how important men are too, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we should be demonising men in the workplace. Yeah. And I think we should be celebrating women's decisions. I think the feminists shouldn't dictate to women that they should want to be CEOs if yeah. they don't want to be. Yeah. That should be up to us. And I think that we have more choice than we ever have done. But you can't get rid of biological differences. Yeah. Women tend to carry babies. So that obviously does steer things off. Yeah, so on so on that gender pay gap point, I mean I think there obviously there will be certain cult. Then you could make the argument that there are kind of cultural factors why, at age forty, women make the decisions yeah. they do. And it might be kind of yeah. societal. Like I could imagine a situation in twenty years' time where women are less <clears throat> likely to decide to spend as much yeah. time with their kids. I don't know if that'd be better or yeah. worse. Like I guess the feminist line is, oh, it's it just as long as it trends towards equality and pay, it must be a good thing. I think it's slightly more nuanced than that. Everything's not about economics, you know. Yeah, exactly. Even though obviously this is a free market think tank. There's so much more in life than earning, you know, a few more thousand a year. Yeah. People decide to step back from high-flying careers because they value other things. And that should be a choice, and it shouldn't be sort of extrapolated to say that the whole of society is sexist. But I also think you can't even talk about... This is another issue, which is, like... So, I am not someone who thinks that women don't face any barriers. I think men probably do as well, but I don't like a men's yeah, Definitely, right. like my sister in banking, like, she's definitely had some workplace sexism. Yeah, like... And you, you often get sort of underestimated. I know I've been on a, a, a panel where someone thought I was someone's assistant yeah. rather than actually on the panel speaking for myself. Exactly, yeah. But I don't get angry about that because maybe... Because I, look, I know that I look young. 
Yeah. And I could very easily have been that person's assistant. You know, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily sexism. People should be careful not to offend people, obviously. We don't want to go around offending people. But, um, yeah, I but, think it's... But, yeah, so I was just going to say that that... So, you can... I still think there are discussions to be had about whether or not there might be some ways in which there mm. are kind of, like decisions which are made which might be a result of the social system we live in, for example. I don't I don't think that's a cut a closed case. I think there are arguments to be made, but it's a nuanced thing. Like you, you can't just have a dogmatic position on that either, I think. Because it's not like we're living sixty years ago when there were obviously systemic barriers. It's now a situation where it's more of a cultural mm-hmm. thing. But the way that the gender pay gap thing is discussed and is presented, people who aren't that well versed in it, who just see what comes out of the kind of liberal left publications Mm -hmm. on this issue or who hear commentators talking about it tend to think that basically it's down to sexist individual decisions being made which deliberately uh, prejudice women and actually just even if you take a kind of feminist line on that that isn't really the way which you can explain the gap because the gap as you said up to age 40 ish doesn't really exist in terms of pay and but it's presented as Oh, Which is are... like so surprising, right? Considering the the media, considering the discussion, it, exactly, and that's considering the discussion, that's the disconcerting thing. It's, it's crazy. Like, you wouldn't have thought it. You don't need to be. A, you don't need to not think that there are barriers yeah. in order to see it. Just, just like on a purely yeah. factual basis, those statistics are presented in a way which is basically deliberately misleading. Because if it's the case that there's this sexism against women, which is meaning they don't get given jobs, it should apply consistently throughout. Mm-hmm the employment process. You can't just yeah. present it as someone who suddenly kicks in age 40. And it also puts businesses in a bit of an awkward position because what are they supposed to do? If they've got a big gender pay gap, are they supposed to then hire loads of junior men to sort of balance it out? Or yeah, exactly. sort of could, yeah. try and like m- move things around, engineer things into a way where they won't have it? Yeah. You can't just go in and suddenly start you know, promoting women ahead of men if, yeah. they've, if they've been there less time or whatever. It's just... You know, I think we just need to take things with a pinch of salt and stop looking at this sort of dodgy data and drawing the data these is ridiculous. Really, really dodgy. It is really That's dodgy. What's really weird but it's difficult this. to say that. I imagine if I was at university now, I imagine it would be hard to have those discussions. But I just remember at university because I came at this from a really feminist standpoint, and I still am kind of feminist, and I want there to be complete equality, and I do think there are problems which women face. I just can't just because I believe that stuff doesn't yeah. mean that I'm going to look at data which literally presents one set of conclusions yeah. and then just draw the wrong conclusions as a way of convincing people of my point of view. It really just doesn't make any yeah. sense. Also, like, my feminist icons in the media are people like Julia Hartley Brewer, who doesn't buy into this sort of stuff. Yeah. People like Joanna Williams, um, people like Kate Andrews. Yeah. All these women are say are proving themselves... Yeah. And they're not blaming it on everyone else. Yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't <laughs> you know. Really it's a weird, there's a positive message for women and I think um I think this is a good time to be making it because I think the mood music is changing. Yeah. I think um you know Jordan Peterson and people like that got huge amounts of grief for stating factual evidence that showed that men and women are different across a number of um areas. And that's not to say that you should make blanket assumptions about individuals. Yeah. But you can still look at data without being then called a bigot just for exactly. the data, pointing out differences. Data can't really be bigoted, that's the yeah. point. Yeah. I just think we should be careful about not pitting men and women against each other. Yeah. You know, whenever you whenever you look at the sort of the the Guardian website or whatever, or yeah. across the media, there's all these anti men um stories that are constant I see. Sort yeah. of that like um men are responsible for a rape culture or in in universities or that there's sexism in the workplace or harassment and while there may well be these issues Mm. it takes we should also be focusing on how we're working well together and how we support one another but also that rape culture thing is like again i am a feminist and i wouldn't dismiss the idea that there are some people who behave in a really bad way in university but i think saying that the situation in advanced Western countries, in universities, is basically one where women are constant, like, very, very badly at risk of getting raped. It's yeah. actually just, not to say that there aren't obviously cases where that happens, which is awful, but in general that just isn't the situation. All these different reporting mechanisms are sort of used to try and, ex- to me it seems like they're trying to show the problem to be bigger than it is, and just makes people sort of dismissive of these statistics, because they see them coming up time and time again, and they look around them and they're like, 
that, things don't seem that bad. And yeah. there's, sort of, there's sort of this disconnect, isn't mm. there? Yeah, I definitely think that's... I mean, something... So, something which I guess we should also talk about is, so there's this tendency in the feminist movement on the kind of identitarian side of the left, I guess you would call it, mm. um, <clears throat> to depict things as unbelievably bad whether it be economically um in terms of the culture in society in terms of how it treats women in terms of how ethnic minorities are treated in society and all of those things are things which is worth thinking about for example poverty is something you should try and get rid of as much as you can or if there is any discrimination against men or women you should try and against women or against any ethnic minority obviously you want to try and stop that being the case but in general the picture that's painted is society being basically really dystopian and really awful when in historic terms and relative to basically everywhere else, it's those things are way less significant than they've ever been before. And so there's that really weird tendency, which I think at the same time goes hand in hand with a complete reluctance to call out actual instances of extreme bigotry. I mean, definitely. I mean, if you look at the feminist movement, the Me Too movement, what have they focused on? They focused on usually middle class, highly educated, People in business or in, you know, industries who have had someone touch their knee inappropriately. Yeah. Or even worse, you know, sexual abuse, proper sexual abuse. And meanwhile, there's an absolute silence from the left on the grooming gangs that are still ongoing throughout the country. Yeah. And that sort of thing, it's just, it just really, really, um, it, it's so frustrating yeah. but that there's such a silence on these issues. I mean, I actually looked on the day that the Manchester Evening News, they um, did a write-up of what was going on in Manchester yeah. um, and the silence around it and the cover-up. I think this was, what, a couple of weeks ago that they did this write-up. I looked at the sort of left-wing commentators, absolute silence. Yeah. And what does that do? It leaves it to Tommy Robinson and it leaves it to Kate Hopkins to talk about because they will talk about it. Yeah. And we know they'll talk about it. And the problem is, is that it should be everyone talking about this, left and right. It's the most hideous um, crimes that are going on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it definitely undermines. That, that's kind of a concern I've got. Is I, I think... That it's an awkward topic for people yeah. who don't want to ever see that there might be, um, you know, a cultural element to it. I mean, also, if you look at, say, the situation in Iran. So yeah. I've, been hang- I've been meeting with a few Iranians recently just to discuss what's going on there. If you look at the situation in Iran, speak to Iranian women who are involved in the Iranian feminist movement, like the White Wednesdays campaign, mm-hmm. they just constantly say the same thing, which is... Why aren't Western feminists and why aren't the Western left and Western progressive circles giving us any support? And it's like they are so angry about the fact that they're fighting these really dangerous battles against unbelievably extreme theocratic government and theocratic societal rule and so on. And there's absolute silence. And the left are too busy just calling out Donald Trump for a tweet that he posts, you know? It's the priorities that the left have and it's always this sort of anti-Western outlook that drives it. Yeah. Um they'd rather cosy up to sort of regimes like like Iran yeah. than actually point out the flaws in, in in those theocratic regimes. And as you say, there's a lot of there's so many talking going back to the feminism, there are so many women in Iran and in other Middle Eastern Islamic countries yeah. who are, you know, um, campaigning to remove their hijab or who are, you know, fighting against forced marriages or FGM and things like this. And these are the people that Western feminists should be supporting. Yeah. You're not talking about the gender pay gap at EasyJet. I mean, yeah. like, seriously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the problem is, is that people think, people sort of equate caring about these issues, about not being pro, being sort of racist or whatever, if you start talking about the burqa or something like that. And these are really important feminist issues that we need to tackle and we need to talk about. Yeah. Um, and... The left are just silent on it, mostly. Not yeah. all, but the far the far left are. Yeah. The sort of liberal left as well. I just think, yeah, it definitely undermines the uh, validity of their campaigns in the West. Because I, I am not... I think that even if even something like the Me Too stuff or if someone touches someone's leg at a dinner, like, I don't know, there's a debate to be had about that. But even then, I would kind of be intrinsically on the side of the people who are complaining about that, saying, like, that shouldn't be happening. I don't think that women should have anything happen to them, really, that any man wouldn't face. So I am all in favour of fighting the kind of, even on the minutiae level. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But also, I just think that loses its 
it's hard to be on board with those points, which I am, if the people making them are at the same time refusing to talk about things like women getting stoned to death in Afghanistan. Yeah. I saw it's like it doesn't happen. Yeah, there was you more out, at... Like Lawrence Fox, you know, when all questions yeah. Lawrence Fox said, oh, like he said basically two things which called a massive outcry. outcry. The first was he said, I think we live in a generally tolerant society mm-hmm. and that's why he thinks it's lovely, which I actually think is pretty nice. I quite like hearing someone saying we live in a tolerant society because we basically do. Obviously there's some intolerance, but basically it's pretty tolerant. And then he said that he wasn't going to judge Labour candidates based on whether they're men or women. So you can, there's a, Discussion to be had about whether that's some form of like extreme <laughs> sexism. I really, really don't think but it you is. Know, but these things, the thing is, is so funny. But, but there was more outcry about that yeah. than there was about the fact that a woman literally a few days after that got stoned to death. Yeah, no. that you can't yeah. possibly claim to be a really radical feminist, which I consider myself to be a feminist. And as someone who's looking at that neutrally, how can you be more offended by someone saying they don't judge people based on their sex than you are by the fact that someone literally got stoned to death? Also, what is just what I always have to remind myself when I get frustrated about these things is that the vast majority of the public agreed with Lawrence Fox. Yeah. It was on Twitter. Yes, there was a Twitter storm from the left and from a lot of young young people as well who sort of buy into this sort of and in, into the sort of woke culture. Um, but the vast majority of the British public agree with Lawrence Fox. Yeah. They think they don't believe in women only shortlists. They want people to get to where they to get to their get their success from merit not yeah. from being you know put on an all female shortlist and i think it just does women a disservice who i i i mean how many extraordinary and talented women do you know who can yeah. make it without having to push a man out of the way